All right, good day and welcome everyone uh, back to the show. And today is uh, chronic fatigue syndrome question and answer. We've got some uh, great questions, have some information about it, uh, have some questions about potential new treatments, uh, also what's good and bad about the way that we decide somebody has chronic fatigue syndrome, what can the way we decide and the way we diagnose it uh, help us with the treatment and uh, investigations into what's wrong and more. So let's just jump right in. Want to talk about chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, as usual, I've got, you know, a lot of background material. I just went through and uh, looked, you know, at uh, recent publications, but also some recent uh, medical reporting. So as you know, most of the time when I post things or I post uh, links, I try to make them either primary sources from medical literature, or uh, if there's something I feel that was really well done uh, in medical reporting, so it's not really peer reviewed, but uh, usually there's a medical reviewer and then a, a professional writer, a science writer. So I've got those things. And uh, as you might remember, the links and the show notes we put up when we move this over uh, tonight or tomorrow to the YouTube channel. And so if you're watching live on CTR radio, uh, thank you. And you can uh, follow us there. You can also uh, probably be watching live on Facebook live. It'll, it'll be on there right now. And uh, then, as I said later, we're going to put up on all the pod burners. So pretty much any pod burner that you have, whether it's Google or Apple or uh, iHeartRadio, et cetera, uh, look for medicine and health with Dr. Paul Anderson, uh, and then uh, like and share there, but the YouTube channels where we put the video up and under there, we put up li any links that I have. So this one will have, I don't know, four, five, six links uh, that go to things in case you want to do some background digging. And that's why I put them in there. Now, uh, if you're not familiar with uh, YouTube, what we do there is if it's on your phone or a small device, Below the uh, video on the right side, there's a little arrow down or a chevron. Uh, click on that and it opens up the description box. That's where the links are. If you're on your laptop or a bigger computer screen, it's usually under the, uh, under the video picture on the left side and it says show more. And that doesn't really look like a link to me, but you just click on show more. It'll open up the description box where the links are. So that's where I put them. Uh, and you can do that there. So uh, thank you so much. We got a lot of new subscribers. Please like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell on YouTube. And it's kind of nice because uh, from CTR Radio, where we produce the program and the podcast and the video, we can move that over uh, to uh, YouTube and, and keep it there on my YouTube channel for, uh, uh, for posterity and, uh, and sharing, et cetera. So as we get into this, I want to just kind of jump right in. Most people have heard of chronic fatigue syndrome. It was first described in the 1930s, actually, so it's not like a, a new uh, problem. But it's one of those frustrating chronic illnesses, at least in my experience. So although um, I certainly you know, have done a lot of background work and kind of updating, is there anything new in the research and new in what people are thinking clinically? Um, Many people know me from my work in oncology and cancer, uh, and our practice was always split between oncology and then chronic illness, and, and a large portion of the chronic illness population that we serve were chronic fatigue fibromyalgia patients, and those are two different uh, medical diagnoses, but uh, they have a lot of crossovers we'll talk about. So I have a great deal of experience and a long amount of experience in the chronic illness population, especially chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia. And for a period of about five or six years, I actually took over a uh, very large uh, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia clinics patients. Uh, the clinic had to move or I guess the clinicians had to move and the patients didn't. And uh, so we added them to our patient population. So certainly a lot of experience there. So I'm gonna talk about uh, some of the research, some of the new treatment that people are talking about and what's good and bad about that with some of the frustrations that patients run into, but then also um, I'm gonna try and inform it with a lot of uh, you know, uh, rubber meets the road. Uh, treatment that, that I've been involved in and even some research uh, over the years. So 
when we look at this, um, chronic fatigue syndrome is uh, also known as myalgic encephalomyelitis, which sounds horrible. Uh, and MECFS is the way that they usually do the shorthand for it. And if you look at chronic fatigue syndrome, what you have, it, hence the name, at least the common name, chronic fatigue syndrome, and there's some updated names too, but most people know chronic fatigue. So I'm just going to stick with that. Um, if you look at that, what you're really looking at is a, a syndrome where there's not another medical reason for fairly profound fatigue and uh, exer exercise or exertional intolerance. Now, this gets into not just splitting hairs, but some problems that there are, which creates a lot of frustration with the diagnosis, or at least carrying the diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome, or whatever else you want to call it. And that is that part about the criteria that says there has to be no other uh, medical diagnosis that would account for these symptoms. Now, that makes total sense. Because what are other things that might cause chronic fatigue, exertional intolerance, some of the other things that we're going to talk about symptom-wise? Well, you could have cancer and have that. So you certainly wouldn't want to call it chronic fatigue and have it be cancer. Uh, you could have any number of autoimmune diseases that give you the same symptoms. You wouldn't want to not treat your cancer or your autoimmune disease and you know, have it be from those symptoms. So that makes a lot of sense. You know, you wouldn't want to have it be undiagnosed diabetes, which can do that. You wouldn't want to have it be undiagnosed uh, profound anemia or any number of other problems. So it makes sense that you would say in your diagnostic criteria, well, there has to be no other medical explanation. Here's the problem that that's led us to. And that is in the world of medicine, there is still a large number of, not all doctors, but there's a large number of doctors who still look at chronic fatigue, you know, CFSME as a, uh, as a neuropsychiatric problem. And it's, uh, it's really not. I mean, anyone who's worked with a lot of chronic fatigue patients know it's not. But there's a lot of doctors, and we'll talk about this, who just, you know, don't want to sort of move away from the neuropsychiatric basis of chronic fatigue syndrome. So they will say, well, if we're calling it a diagnosis of exclusion and there's no other medical reason uh, for the chronic fatigue, then uh, why is it not, you know, a psychiatric diagnosis? Well, that not only, you know, upsets uh, obviously the patients and often their families, but other clinicians like myself who try and treat chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia uh, through in, uh, integrative multi-system uh, treatment protocol, treatment rubric. So just to read a couple of quotes here, um, uh, you know, distinguished from medical and psychiatric uh, conditions by uh, fatigue that is debilitating for more than six months. So again, if it's just a couple of weeks, it, you could have the flu or COVID or something like that, obviously. Um, including combinations of cognitive dysfunction, brain fog, and other things are very common, uh, total body pain, unrefreshing sleep that does not restore normal function. So another thing, and I just, just want to talk about this uh, quickly, is uh, this statement of uh, unrefreshing sleep that does not restore normal function. So most people, you get worn out and uh, you sleep and you have good sleep. And you're, you feel much better the next day, your fatigue is, is kind of gone, or, or maybe you really get worn down or, you know, students, we see this a lot where they overdo during finals and they, you know, they get a lot of rest for a few days afterwards, they kind of perk back up, right? That's sort of the normal human pattern. So uh, unrefreshing sleep that does not restore normal function would indicate that there's some sort of problem if your sleep really is happening and then you uh, are not restoring, you know, your exertional tolerance and your, uh, your energy and all, and your cognitive function, all this stuff, there's got to be a problem. Well, the reason I stopped there is in uh, current and older diagnostic textbooks, there is this misnomer that a lack of return of energy after sleep is a psychiatric problem. And so this becomes another one of the problematic portions of uh, people's lives 
and diagnosis, especially if your clinician wants to put this all, it's all in your head, quote unquote, uh, is they'll say, well, you know, normally people, you know, who have fatigue but are sleeping well, um, you know, and don't have a medical reason like cancer, anemia, diabetes, et cetera. Uh, if that's happening, it, you know, it's usually a mental, emotional, or psychiatric problem. Well, it can be, but that doesn't mean that's the only reason for it. And this becomes a very frustrating also if you're trying to treat these patients because their other doctors may be looking at them as you need psychiatric care, you don't need medical care. Uh, so other things, uh, post-exertional malaise uh, and uh, stress exacerbation. So exertional or physical or mental emotional stressors will exacerbate all of your symptoms. Now the World Health Organization, which we've heard a lot about in the days of COVID in case you didn't know who they were, um, classifies MECFS as a neurological illness, which is, you know, at least in the ballpark. Um, and the big problem, as they say here, is there are no objective diagnostic tests, verified biomarkers, curative medications, or really curative treatments for MECFS. And so the goal is usually to manage symptoms and improve functional capacity. Now I'm gonna put in uh, links to both the British Medical Journal and the National Library of Medicine here in the US. And they have some really actually very good things you can read in there if you wanna take a deep dive in, maybe you or a family member has been diagnosed with this. And often what you'll find, and the reason I put those up at the top is um, you'll find if you read the actual, you know, diagnostic criteria and all that in British Medical Journal or the National Library of Medicine diagnostic criteria here in the US, there is a lot more to it than most of your clinicians are probably telling you or working with or doing. So I will put those in when we get over on YouTube. Again, thanks uh, for all the new subscribers. Uh, please continue to subscribe, like, and share. We try and get good information out here. Now, one of the things that um, is a frustration is if we say chronic fatigue syndrome is profound fatigue, uh, post-exertional intolerance, et cetera, that lasts for six months or longer and does not have a medical uh, diagnosis that is causing the symptoms. So whether it's the exertional intolerance, the whole body fatigue, uh, can be sleep disorder, cognitive disorder, all that stuff. No medical diagnosis. Well, that's a little bit of a misnomer. So I said earlier that what that means is that we've ruled out the big things. We, we know you don't have cancer, or we know as much as we can know that. Uh, we know that you, know, you don't have an autoimmune disease. We know that you don't have uh, you know, a... Uh, a primary metabolic problem like a hypothyroidism or uh, diabetes that's undiagnosed or profound anemia, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we've looked at all those things. So that's good. We don't want you running around with an undiagnosed disease and calling it chronic fatigue syndrome because there's stuff you can do about those other things. But here's what we often saw. And this is with uh, literally thousands of patients. Okay, this is, this is my own personal experience as a clinician. When you look at chronic fatigue syndrome patients, what we would normally do is uh, not just screening for those other problems, and certainly we did all of that, but we would look in a number of different core functional areas in the body, because often, while there might be a little blip here and there, so somebody may discover they have type two diabetes, but they get that corrected and their fatigue doesn't go away. They might discover their hypothyroid and they get that corrected and that fatigue doesn't go away. Um, what we found was uh, with chronic fatigue syndrome, looking at the whole person and all of the ways the human body can start to break down that would create fatigue or a fatiguing painful illness, we did better to look at, diagnose, and treat underlying issues sort of in a 360-degree uh, circle around the, the person 
uh, as opposed to trying to focus on one thing. Now, this is frustrating a lot of times for other doctors and patients. For other doctors, it's because they're really not trained a lot of the times to do this. They're not trained in sort of this integrative, holistic look at the body. They're trained to find one thing and hopefully treat that and make the problem go away. Most of our patients would come in having had one thing found. It could be a diagnosis of Epstein-Barr virus and that was being treated or a diagnosis of hypothyroid or a diagnosis of some GI problems or a diagnosis of whatever. Uh, and the problem that would occur is they would get better and then they would crash again. Well, why would that happen? It's, you think of it like you have a bucket holding your vitality. Uh, that's you know what makes us healthy and feel good and all that. And then you start poking holes, little holes in it all over. Well, if you find one hole and plug it up, what's going to happen? The other holes are still going to leak, right? Well, it's the same thing with illness. And what I would tell patients, the way to think about it is, we could have a stack of, you know, 20 quarters sitting here, and that could uh, illustrate, you know, one disease. And one big disease, sometimes if you take care of that, makes the other things feel better. But what would happen if you had five quarters stacked up with that disease and then five with another and then five with another and five with another. So your 20 quarters were spread out over a number of different uh, functional disease areas in your body. What that's going to do is that's going to give you a lot of targets where maybe you don't need a big gun or you don't need a whole bunch of treatment on one, but you need a lot of treatment on everybody. Or if you go back to the bucket analogy, what you want to do is you want to plug as many holes in the bucket as you can. And with true chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, and again, I'm using that as the one term, there, there are other terms, but I'm just going to use that to make it easy. Our experience with, you know, well over a thousand patients, uh, definitely four figures worth of patients over time was in true CFS. If you did not look for all of these things and treat all these things on a consistent ongoing basis, nothing else worked. And that leads us to a lot of the discussion, some of which I do want to talk about briefly uh, with regard to the um, uh, common statement in medicine that there is no curative treatment and there's no, uh, you know, long-term uh, therapies that work, et cetera. And that is a true statement and a false statement at the same time. So the true part about it is we don't have a magic bullet that is the chronic fatigue syndrome treatment that we put in and it makes you better. Okay. So if you have certain infections, uh, we can give you an antibiotic for a bacterial infection and it usually will kill the infection and then the infection is gone, right? That's the medical model of you know one shot, one kill. So that's the normal acute model. Well, there's nothing about chronic fatigue syndrome that matches the acute care model. You're way beyond acute care at that point. And this is why I say, Yes, it's true that there is no, uh, there is no curative treatment, there's no long-term therapies that uh, eradicate the disease, et cetera, but that's because they're looking at it as requiring one therapy to clear out everything else. It's not going to work, okay? okay? Trust me. If you find one treatment that cures your fibromyalgia you pro or your chronic fatigue syndrome, excuse me, um, then uh, you, you probably didn't have actual CFSME because there's not one treatment that'll do it. So then you say, well, that's kind of a bummer. Um, do you have any good news for us? Well, yeah, I do. Uh, so what I want to talk about are ways to get into and ways to access into this um, uh, collage of problems. Now, here's another thing just to keep in mind, because I keep saying, well, it's multifactorial. You got to treat all the holes in the bucket, so the bucket and all that. Is, and this is something that drives researchers crazy for hopefully obvious reasons. Is there a common group of things. So you're saying back up and treat the holes in the bucket. Is it always the same holes in everybody's bucket that creates uh, chronic fatigue? And the answer is no. There are some commonalities. There's some things that are more common, but here's the problem as the clinician. And, I, and I've been treating people with this for three decades. I've been training 
uh, other doctors how to do it. And the biggest problem that clinicians run into after they get over the fact that it's not one problem, that they can just find one problem and treat it. The next step is they can't just check three things repeatedly and have that fix all of the people because fatigue is a constitutional system. That means it's a whole body-wide problem. And so your body operates on a lot of different levels and with a lot of different physiologic inputs that go on. And so if that's going on, then it would stand a reason that you could create a constitutional symptom like fatigue through a large number of possible combinations of problems. And so then not only does that frustrate patients, but then the other clinicians are like, so you, you mean I really have to back up and I have to check a lot of things in each area on these patients? And the, the short answer is yes, you do. And here's why. If you don't, then you're going to wind up going down the, the, the pathway of diminishing returns and so, for example, in the hormone, the endocrine system, an area we check a lot of things in, you check one thing and you find that, like low thyroid or something like that, you treat that, the person gets better, and then they crash again, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work? Why? It's because there's other things wrong. You can't just check one organ system within, uh, within your uh, physiologic system. So you can't just check the thyroid when you're looking into uh, the hormonal system. Now, there may be trouble there. So you need to check it. But there's a lot of other things that make up the hormonal milieu and uh, either uh, the hormones kick into, you know, positive health or negative health. So I want to go through the areas that we normally look at, but I wanted to clear up a couple of things. I got some really great questions uh, and I just want to talk about them and I'll put, actually, there's some nice uh, articles that I found that uh, it will help if, if you were one of the people who had this question or asked it. Uh, in, in the chat or uh, in the comment boxes or wherever, uh, you know, with uh, social media, I get uh, feedback on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube and Facebook and, um, you know, all of the other places I am. And so I never remember exactly where all the questions come from. But another uh, question that comes up is, and I, I even uh, misspoke earlier, and <laughs> so hopefully I didn't confuse anyone is, well, there's fibromyalgia, which is another diagnosis of exclusion and chronic fatigue syndrome. And so I put an article in uh, by a medical writer who happens to have chronic fatigue syndrome and then a medical reviewer, uh, Dr. Marcelin, a medical doctor who reviewed the paper. And the paper has been around for a little while, but it's an article about, uh, basically it says, Half the people diagnosed with fibromyalgia fit the bill for chronic fatigue syndrome too. Are they really just the same disease? And we, this came up a lot because we had, um, when we picked up the um, patients from this chronic fatigue syndrome clinic, which was very specialized, uh, it was chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia patients. Now there, there are a lot of similarities, but also there are differences. So this was probably the most common question I got that triggered this particular uh, podcast. And that is, are, are they just the same thing? Well, they have a lot of similarities, but they have differences too that are important to remember. Now, what I'm going to say, and I will probably do a separate podcast on fibromyalgia, but to shortcut that, if you happen to be listening and you feel like you have more fibromyalgia and less chronic fatigue syndrome, the idea of taking a 360 degree look at you as a patient and checking as many organ systems and places the body breaks down as possible, that still applies. There may be different problems, but it still applies. So um, statistically, fibromyalgia occurs in more people, at least the way the CDC keeps track of these things about 5 million with uh, fibromyalgia and one to 2 million with chronic fatigue syndrome. If you look at fibromyalgia, about half to two thirds of the people fit the criteria for chronic fatigue as well. So there's a lot of crossover. And so in many people, up to half of fibromyalgia patients, uh, you could probably have a diagnosis that went either way. Now, if you are looking for a curative treatment that's one treatment, 
then that might be frustrating. But if you remember that with chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia, you have to look at all the holes in the bucket and you have to treat all the holes in the bucket. It makes it a little easier to feel like the label is less of an issue. We would literally have people come in and they would get angry if we didn't label them correctly because they needed to have a particular name for their disease in order for it to uh, make sense to them, which is fine. We tell them, well, you fit the criteria for this versus that. Um, but really what we tried to move people towards for their uh, own consciousness was a diagnosis of a complex chronic illness, because yes, it might be labeled chronic fatigue syndrome, for example, but complex chronic illness is a little bit more descriptive of why your body broke down and what's wrong with it, right? So what else they say in this thing? Well, the links between chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia include um, a, a number of the symptoms, obviously. Now, when you see research, one of the things to keep in mind is that fibromyalgia research, at least for the beginning decades, was done mostly in the rheumatology world. The rheumatologists are people who treat your, you know, a lot of your autoimmune issues, rheumatic diseases, joint problems, inflammatory problems, et cetera. And uh, chronic fatigue syndrome uh, researchers were mostly immune system people, immunologists, virologists, et cetera, because initially there was a thought and it's, it's still actually true. It's just not the only thing that there was a viral uh, trigger for chronic fatigue. Well, there are often viral triggers, but they're not the only trigger. Again, you can't have one trigger to a complex illness that affects you all over. Um, so chronic pain and fatigue are common to both fibro and chronic fatigue. The difference is usually that in fibromyalgia, there's more pain and less uh, fatigue focus, whereas in chronic fatigue, there's pain, but the fatigue is the main focus. Now, if, if you've never experienced chronic, and this is another thing that comes up in the sort of psychosocial world of the patient, is if you've never experienced chronic fatigue that is profound, you don't know what it feels like to wake up having even slept well, maybe for days and weeks, and still feel drained of all of your energy. And that's literally what it feels like in chronic fatigue. Now with fibromyalgia, the people will have a component of that, but it will be uh, almost overwhelmed by pain, which is why the fibromyalgia diagnosis originally was pushed over to the rheumatology world because there's other rheumatologic diseases that look like it. And the rheumatology uh, world basically pushed fibromyalgia back and said, somebody else deal with this. Now there's great rheumatologists who deal with these things, but the, by and large, that's what happened. Um, now, something that I would say, and th this is from research, so this means they're making declarative statements. Um, Chronic fatigue syndrome, it's very common to see fever, swollen glands, other signs of inflammation. This kind of goes with the chronic fatigue people having probably some viral and other infectious etiologies that they're dealing with. Uh, so very true, okay? Um, and in fibromyalgia, they don't see an inflammatory response. Now, what I would say is having treated, you know, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of both of these um, over the last three decades, you can't really make declarative statements like that. I've seen plenty of fibro people with uh, um, inflammatory responses. Both of them have disruptions in REM sleep, so the deep type of REM sleep. But there's certainly similarities. More women than men uh, tends to be people in their 40s or 50s, although in uh, especially the last decade, I've seen many younger people with uh, either fatigue, fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue. Uh, so disrupted sleep. And then uh, there are different uh, treatments, but they're basically all done in the world of uh, symptom control. Okay. So what I want to do here is to now kind of get into the specifics of what are the areas where we look for the holes in the bucket? Okay. Where are the energy leaks, the physiologic problems, um, the places where things go wrong. So now we'll transition over and get into the areas that we like to look at. So 
One of the areas I already mentioned was hormonal, the endocrine system. So it's very common that a chronic fatigue fibromyalgia patient will come in and they'll already be diagnosed as hypothyroid, low thyroid. Now they might be diagnosed something else, but low thyroid. But certainly if that hasn't been looked at, it needs to be looked at. But what we would do with a true chronic fatigue patient in our workup is take a step back. And what I would always tell them is that their lab tests were more than a month or two old. They really didn't help us because number one, the lab tests done usually in primary care were too limited. And number two, um, if they were sicker over those months, their labs may be very different as well. So in the hormonal arena, we would look at big picture areas and then do specific testing to parse out problems. So in the world of the hormones, the adrenal hormones, we would look at the cortisol levels. If they were having circadian sleep problems, we might do a cortisol output throughout the day. So cortisol and the adrenal output became very important. With the thyroid, we looked not only at just pure, simple hypothyroid, but we would look at a number of critical factors. We would look at the uh, TSH, which is a global marker. We would look at the free T3 and free T4, which are the actual gland making uh, the inactive T4 and the active T3. And we would look at the balance there. A lot of people had low T3 output, which is not great. So triggers fatigue and stuff. We'd also look at something called reverse T3. Now, I've talked about this before. Reverse T3 is not a great marker in healthy people, but in sick people, it's actually quite predictive for resistance, thyroid resistance. Uh, so reverse T3, we would do that. So free T4 and 3, the output. Reverse T3, which is immunologically created to block your thyroid. And then other thyroid blockers would be the antibodies. So a lot of people have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is the most common reason for low thyroid, and it's actually an autoimmune disease. So again, we get into the splitting hairs with, well, there's not another medical reason. Well, it's not the only reason, but it's a part reason. So certainly if you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, you not only need support for your thyroid, but you need support for the autoimmune problem. The next thing that we would look at, so we've got the corticoids, the adrenal output, the thyroid and thyroid resistance and antibodies and all that. We would also look at the reproductive hormones. So you look at the, uh, S, and this is men or women, estrogen and testosterone and progesterone, you look at the balance between them. Now, if you have a, a cycling woman, you need to know what, you know, where in the cycle it was. Uh, but here's a couple of things. There is a balance or an imbalance that occurs in very chronically ill people where their estrogen keeps rising, men or women. And as estrogen rises, androgens like testosterone decrease in their ability to work. And in uh, women or men, a uh, small amount in, of decrease in testosterone binding can lead to a lot of chronic illness problems. So we don't want to have that happen. So we look at the reproductive hormones and we follow those and treat them as needed. We also look kind of critically at blood sugar uh, because that's an endocrine issue. Now, certainly if someone knows that they're a type one diabetic and they're on insulin, uh, all that, that's got to be managed. But we found a lot of people who were early or even full-blown type two diabetics uh, that tend to be diagnosed a little bit later in life. And that was a piece of their fatigue. It wasn't the only reason, piece of their fatigue. So we would look at the hemoglobin A1C, something called a C-peptide, the fasting blood sugar, and then there are more tests that you can do there if needed. But why such a focus on uh, silent diabetes, et cetera, other than diabetes uh, causes a lot of problems for you if it's undiagnosed? The other reasons for that is if you have blood sugar control problems, blood sugar control problems lead to a couple of major things that create chronic fatiguing, debilitating problems. One of them being an inflammatory response that then can feed forward onto the other hormonal systems and inflame you, mess up your other hormones. But then the other thing is, is that chronic higher levels of uncontrolled blood sugar lead to fatigue because sugar that's in your blood is not getting in your cells where it's uh, supposed to be creating energy. So one of the things that you see with people who have diabetes is increasing amount of fatigue for many, many reasons, but that, those are just two of those reasons. So blood sugar became very, very important as well. Then we would look at rheumatologic things. Now I said that the rheumatologist uh, kind of got uh, 
uh, given uh, the fibromyalgia patients and chronic fatigue were sent to whoever would take them. Uh, we still want to make sure there's not rheumatologic disorders. And so that would include things like anti-nuclear antibody testing. We'd work people up for the common uh, autoimmune diseases. There are panels that can do that. And what we would find is there were a fair number of people who had, um, we might catch a full-blown autoimmune disease, and that wasn't the only cause. So they had other problems, other holes in the buck to fill. But again, it's sort of like silent diabetes. We would catch these people and at least we'd be able to get, get them, you know, get treatment for the autoimmunity as well. Now, treating the autoimmunity would help, but it wouldn't make the chronic fatigue syndrome go away. So it's, a, it's part and parcel of the whole thing. Then the other side of immunology, so there's the rheumatologic side where we're looking at, you know, autoimmunity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the other side are chronic infections. And this is one that was hard for a lot of my colleagues to get their, wrap their heads around. But we would look at the most common uh, chronic infectious illnesses that would be, we call them stealth illnesses because they would step back, person's chronically fatigued, but they don't have classic symptoms of one of the viruses or chronic bacteria or, or parasites or other stuff. So sort of two targets we would look for um, illness in. Uh, of the infectious nature. One was systemic illness. And that's uh, the big ones that we would find there are the human herpes virus family, especially Epstein-Barr, cytomegalovirus, et cetera. We screen for those in blood tests. Uh, there's a type of parvovirus, parvo B19, that humans get that can create problems that are uh, chronic illness problems. Uh, there's a few other viruses we would screen for. There's some chronic uh, respiratory infections, uh, the mycoplasma pneumonia, chlamydia pneumonia, and some other ones there uh, that people often carry around and are very draining. We would look at chronic streptococcal illness. So there's blood tests for that uh, that can certainly create a lot of problems. So, you, you know, you think of like strep and you think strep throat. Well, there's a lot of people that go chronic and it becomes just a, a part of their immune dysregulation. And so there's a lot of systemic things we'd, we'd look for, also chronic fungal problems like candida and other fungi, uh, and, and on and on. And people would say, well, I thought it was disproved that there was an infectious cause for chronic fatigue. And the problem is, well, again, if you're looking at one problem causing you know, all of your chronic fatigue, yeah, sure, there's not one cause. Uh, but is it extremely common in chronic fatigue syndrome people to have, you know, one, two, three, four, five, seven infections? Yeah, it's very common, actually. The longer you've been sick, the more of them you pick up. The other target we would look at for infectious and immune problems is the GI tract. So GI tract is super important just because it's got to digest your food and get the nutrients in. Most chronically ill people have messed up GI tract. So that's one thing. But also the GI tract can harbor... Uh, not only a lot of biofilms, but it can harbor a lot of other chronic infectious agents that you may have no digestive symptoms at all. And we do GI tract testing and we find that you've got some really nasty chronic uh, infectious material there or inflammatory stuff. And just like the systemic part of your body, you've got to deal with the infections, and the inflammatory stuff, or um, you're not going to get very far with your chronic fatigue. Then we would look at resistance factors. One of them is one that I mentioned, biofilms, uh, biofilms and other reasons why the immune system isn't functioning like it should. So beyond biofilms, other resistance factors would be, we would check your uh, B cell, your part of the B cell, part of your immunity output. If you are really having a lot of infections, we also would do specialized tests for T cell function, but most screening, we would start with B cells and work our way towards T cells. Interestingly, uh, found a lot of B cell dysfunction in people with chronic fatigue syndrome. And every now and then we would uncover a T cell dysfunction, which is more, um, you could think of it like a hardwired cell mediated immunity problem that we would find. So if we weren't getting answers or if there was a ton of infections, you look for immune dysregulation or immune deficiencies. That's why people get these things a lot. And you don't want to be treating someone forever and ever and then not realize they were born with a primary immune deficiency or something that just didn't get diagnosed yet, which is more common than it seems. Um, 
The next area we'd look at would be things that interfere with normal function. So toxicity is a big one. And we would do screening and then go to deeper testing if we found something in the screening. So the screening would include usually urine tests. You can do a screening test for heavy metals. You can do a screening test for uh, toxic chemicals. And then you do a screening test for biotoxins like mold toxins and things like that. Very, very common that one or all three of those toxic areas are, are afoot. And you think about it like the toxicity could be around us all the time. We could live in a toxic environment, work in a toxic environment. We could have gotten exposed to all kinds of things. And toxins basically sideline your immune system from working well. And so um, if, you, if you're treating, 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 it's just like treating somebody for a bunch of infections, you don't realize they have an immunodeficiency. It's the same problem. You treat people and treat them and treat them and they get better and worse, better and worse. You don't realize they've got some toxic influence that's taken their immune system down, you know, five notches. Uh, you got to treat the underlying immune deficiency, whether it's, you know, primary functional or, you know, due to something like toxins. Another area um, that we would look at a lot, so we've talked about digestive, we've talked about the hormonal, we've talked about immune and resistance factors, toxins. Um, another area is the physical and structural parts of the body. So, and, and not, you know, not every doctor maybe does all these things, but uh, you certainly can refer to people. One thing would be screening people for uh, musculoskeletal problems, structural problems, uh, and, and those are in the purview of a lot of very good, say, chiropractic physicians. Uh, there are certain physical therapists who do a lot with chronic fatigue syndrome, other type of body work people, and sometimes it was a whole team. But you can't, <coughs> excuse me, leave the physical body out because that's where we live. And so that's another area that has to be looked at. And a lot of times it's like people say, well, you know, I've done work with a PT or with a chiropractor or whoever, and it helps, it doesn't, you know, cure it or whatever. Well, it's sort of like, you can also say the same thing about infections or hormonal problems or your gut or whatever. You got to work on all of them. Remember, it's a bucket with a lot of holes in it. So the physical stuff has to be worked on, but it has to be worked on alongside all the other internal medicine things that are going on. Now, another area that's incredibly important uh, is the psychosocial area. And a lot of people get really uh, either upset or kind of skittish about bringing up psychosocial because they thought we were going to be just like all the other doctors who were going to tell them, well, this is all in your head. Uh, and that's not what we meant by, <laughs> by that. There is a huge um, toll on you as a human when you have a, any chronic illness. Uh, the, this book over my shoulder I wrote is, is about that uh, phenomenon in cancer patients and a lot of cancer patients now, we essentially treat them as a chronically ill person uh, who has cancer. And, and so they have a you know, disease that is there. It's not going to go away. There's a lot of mental, emotional you know, things that go on with that. Well, same thing uh, if you've been gaslit by the medical profession and been told this is all in your head and you, sh you don't feel as bad as you do or you're drug seeking or whatever, um, that's not very good for your psyche, right? So you need to have things going on that work on the mind-body connection. And again, it's that one thing will not cure everything else, but just like your physical body, if you leave your mental emotional self out of it, it's not going to work really well. So that becomes very important as well. And then the other area, which is very broad, and I want to talk about last, uh, just because it's probably the most, you know, uh, global thing, uh, is uh, what I refer to when I'm teaching it just a cell function. And that's, that's a disturbingly simple uh, term. Well, that means everything about your cell. You're made up of cells. So there's no part of you that cell function doesn't, uh, doesn't interact with. Your cells are affected by all these other things. So that's the first off. They're affected by toxins, by your hormones, uh, they're affected by your gut and your absorption of nutrients in your gut. They're affected by chronic infections. Uh, they're affected literally by mind, body, psychosocial things through the epigenetic triggers that those trigger uh, on and on and on. Your cells are part and parcel of all this. But what else specifically with your cells? Well, you can kind of break cell function down into a couple of uh, or a few very important things. 
One is cellular nutrition, okay? The other, it goes hand in hand with that because it can't work uh, without each other is cell health. So if your cells are healthy, the membranes around your cells, which hold all of the communication devices and uh, the little channels that let nutrients in and out and let, you know, build stuff on the inside that let toxins out, all of that stuff uh, has to work. And as, as you're chronically ill, your cells get sicker. And so the cell membranes and the organelles in your cells can become very uh, inflamed and oxidized. And you don't die, they don't stop working, thankfully, but they don't work very well. And that doesn't work so hot, okay? So um, if you have nutrition, but you have a sick cell, the nutrition and the cell don't work together very well. If you have a really spunky cell that's working great, but you don't have very good nutrition, uh, reverse problem goes on. So nutrients going in, which is largely is, is your diet and your gut working, and then, you know, supplements after that, and then cell function and health, how long you've been sick. And people say, well, are they good tests for this? Not really without biopsies and stuff like that. But the bottom line is you can look at people. And historically, if you've been sick for two to five years, your cells are not healthy. Okay. You've been sick for five to 10 years or 10 to 30 years, as we've had some people, your cells are really unhealthy. And there's going to be some biological markers we look at in your lab tests. There's other labs than what we mentioned earlier. Uh, and there are specialized tests that can be done looking at nutrient levels. And we certainly look a lot at iron levels and vitamin D and those guys, but, but also other nutrients become very important. So cell function and cell health get into, let's clean up the cell let's allow it to work better. And that has a lot to do with the movement of oxygen in and carbon dioxide out, the movement of nutrients in and toxins out. Uh, but also sometimes there are specific things that need to be done to kind of rebuild the cells. Now, if you have toxins and chronic infections and bad hormones uh, and some of these other things we talked about, the better they get, the healthier your cells get and the more that the nutrients going in will do for your cells. So it's very uh, synergistic. As, you, as the ship goes down, all these areas get worse, but as you start to clinically work on all these areas, all these holes in the bucket, the cells naturally will improve in their function. And here's the thing, when the cells improve their function and when the cells have more energy, you have more energy, okay? What makes the energy that you feel? It's the sum total of the energy producing parts of your cell, which starts with your mitochondria and your nucleus and your cell and works its way out, all of the cells in your body. Now, a lot of people say, well, that's a brain thing. Well, yes, your brain energy gets involved as well, uh, but it's more than that. It's really all of the cells in your body. When they're turned down and they're not working appropriately, you don't feel good. You don't feel energy in your body. The other thing with cell function, and we've got a few minutes so I can describe this, and this is actually some research that we did, and I'm going to, um, right now, with this pen here, remind myself to post the link. Now, this link I'm going to post, I'm going to add it on there, I just thought of it just now, some research that uh, I uh, headed up in, uh, I think it was 2011, you know, about 10, 11 years ago. And it was when we were doing uh, these hundreds of chronic fatigue and fibro patients. And what we did was uh, we took people who were doing this, um, you know, 360 degree integrative medicine, fill all the holes in the bucket that you can treatment. And we took those people and many of them just by doing the this holistic kind of fill all the holes in the bucket, 360 treatment they would progressively get better. But we took the people who were kind of plateaued, like they got better, but they were kind of stuck and started to look at, well, what would be other things? And this relates back to cell function. So this is why I'm looking there. So we're already treating their hormonal issues. We're already treating toxicity. We're already treating the gut. We're already treating uh, chronic infections. We're already working on the psychosocial and the physical and all of that. Why are they plateauing? Well, not the only reason, but another reason that affects the energy in the body and cell turnover and repair of your immune system and your skin, and your connective tissue, really all parts of your body, 
is the ability to go undergo a process called methylation. And so over uh, the years, uh, since the ability, sort of the easy ability to do genomic SNP testing, single nucleotide polymorphism testing, uh, back in those days, we were sort of early on, you look at 2009 and 2011, when we were collecting most of this data, we took the resistant people who got better, but they were stuck. And we tested them for a particular single nucleotide polymorphism called MTHFR. And uh, that codes for methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, a particular enzyme that helps to convert um, folic acid to its, uh, its active form. And without the active form of folic acid, uh, you can't do a lot of methyl uh, transfers, which uh, messes with your brain chemistry, messes with your bone marrow function, messes with your GI turnover function, messes with everything, but especially brain chemistry and uh, the energy producing parts and regenerative parts of your body. And what we found out indeed was, and, and you can look at the data in there, uh, the first thing we did was just an incidence study where we looked at their labs. Now, nowadays, so that, remember this is 12, 13 years ago. Nowadays, we'd look at a whole SNP array and we'd look at all, all their SNPs, but uh, we, we didn't have that availability back then. So we looked at the big one, MTHFR, and what we found is that uh, disproportionately and statistically, you can look at the charts I did, but um, MTHFR, the bad variants of it, which really screw up your methylation, um, were like statistically not very common in the whole population matched to gender and uh, inheritability and stuff, but were very common in these people who were plateaued. So that was the first thing, there's a problem. Well, the next question you have to ask in research is if there's a problem, if we treat the problem, does it help? Okay. So we did symptom surveys with these people to say, you're stuck here, here's all your symptoms and you get a score, et cetera. And then we did an intervention, which is basically we gave the nutrients that would, uh, you can kind of think of these enzymes when they're blocked, you don't, they don't make you know, part B, okay? And part B affects you know, part C, D, and E. So we gave them nutrients that would support what wasn't being made downstream and would make you know, part B and C, D, and E and support it all and all this business. So we put them on that. And in large numbers, I mean, you know, numbers like 50 to 70% it improved once we fixed these problems. Now, other people have looked at this from the other point of view and said it's a magic bullet. So you take their chronic fatigue patients, they put them on methylation support, and some of them it helps, some of it doesn't, and some of it's diminishing return. Well, that's not how, how it works. That is the same as finding a thyroid problem in a chronic fatigue patient, treat the thyroid, and then it, it quits helping. Well, it's not really quitting helping. It's just that you're only plugging one hole. What's the difference? Our patients already had many of the other holes plugged, and then we found a metabolic enzymatic deficiency from their genetics. And then we fixed it, quote unquote, by going around and supplementing the, uh, the nutrients that were supposed to be being made. And we got these big gains in these people. That was only after we fixed all the other stuff and plugged all of the other holes. So uh, that'll be the last link I'll put up uh, in the links. And again, when I talk about the links, so we're, we're live on CTR radio right now, we're live on Facebook. Uh, but we're going to take this video and we're going to move it over uh, to YouTube on the YouTube channel, my YouTube channel. And if you can't find me, just go to D-R-A-N-O-W, DrAnow.com. And it's got links to everything I do. Also, remember, if you like, uh, you don't want to see my face and you want to listen, uh, a lot of people just prefer to listen to the audio. Uh, all, pretty much every pod burner we're over on. So whether it's Apple or Google or iTunes, whoever, uh, Medicine and Health with Dr. Paul Anderson. So this will be up there too. But the links and the show notes, if I have any, but links we'll have for this one, those are going to be on YouTube in the description box on your phone, lower right corner, little down arrow, click on that, opens it up, links will be there on your uh, laptop or your desktop computer, lower left corner, uh, show more, click on show more, and you'll find all of these links. So I'll put the link into that research. Now, uh, interestingly, at the same time as we uh, presented that as a scientific meeting, 
a research group out of Harvard University published a real similar thing, only theirs was on treatment resistant depression. And they found that if they did this same supplemental thing to go around the methylation problems, they could treat drug resistant depression. And uh, I communicated with the author at Harvard. And I said, this is what we found. I sent in my data. And I said, this is what we found with chronic fatigue patients. And he just wrote back and he said, yes, we're seeing exactly the same thing. We weren't studying chronic fatigue, but incidentally, that's what we're finding too. Uh, so again, it's not a silver bullet. That's not the only problem people have, but it was a really big addition when we got there. So again, we're out of time. I uh, want to remember that chronic fatigue syndrome is a unique diagnosis. It's not all in your head, but you have to treat as many holes in the bucket as possible. And uh, in this program, we got into those things, got in those holes, and uh, you can certainly uh, like, share, and subscribe uh, and do the notifications. This is a great one to go back. You can rewind one of the great things about electronics now. And uh, you can go back through some of the information that I uh, shared. But I'm Dr. Paul Anderson from Medicine Health. And I'll be back on my podcast next week to share more with you. Otherwise, we'll see you all on the radio. Thanks.